Welcome to Parker's MMA Show. If you want to learn about all things going down in the fight world, you've come to the right place. Each episode, your host, Parker Keene, will take a deeper dive into the always entertaining world of sanctioned fist fighting. Now here's your host, Parker Keene. Okay, we're good. You good? You did it? We're good. I got it all together. I finished, figured out my technology. What's going on? Man, did it feel good to have fights back. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I was in the best mood all weekend. Felt like we were back to normal. I got great news too, Parker. What's that? We get to do it all again tomorrow. Can't wait. Cannot wait. So let's get right into it. Parker's MMA show coming at you hot. This is episode 36 now. We are rolling. Um, This week's episode, we're going to break down UFC 249, the results, and talk about what we thought of the first card back. And then we're going to dive into the two fight cards coming up this week. We're going to also touch on uh, Conor McGregor being an outlaw on Twitter again. So... (laughs) It's going to be a fun one. Let's get into it. Like always, like, subscribe, share, do all that stuff. And let's do it. Billy, the UFC pulled it off. Man, that rocked. That was that was one of the best cards in maybe the past five years. I think it was the best card of 2020. I think it was probably the best card of the ESPN era. If For we're sure. Being honest. 100%. And they killed it everywhere. The production, the fight week leading up to it obviously besides the jacare situation which i think they handled it as best they could you know we'll we'll dive into that um but let's just get into it what were your thoughts on the card as a whole and what were some of your favorite fights throughout the night and who were you most impressed with surprised with um you know on the card Yeah, so I set this bad boy up in my living room, got, you know, a pay-per-view on the TV, and I had my laptop up with video chatting a couple of my buddies, like, and we watched it from the very first early prelim, walking out Sam Alvey and Ryan Spann, all the way through to the title fight main event, Um, and I I had a couple things written down. I love the, uh, it's starting off, Sam Alvey walks out, he's the first walkout, and He's high five and fake fans and like he's like all over the place. It was great. Um, you know, and then on the prelims, I mean, the Mitchell versus Rosta fight was uh, unbelievable. I, I loved that fight. That was um, a that was a Billy's uh, hardcore wet dream fight. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then you had, I mean, like, you know, Calvin Cater, Jeremy Stevens, Nico Price against Vincente Luque. Um you know, Esparza against Waterson was a pretty exciting fight. That was pretty back and forth. Um, for me, most impressive performance. I mean, how do you not give it to Francis Ngannou? Uh, 20 seconds. I mean, it, it, it was it, it was death touch. It was it was literally like, and he was out. It wasn't a TKO. Like how uh, how vicious was that with no. It was just, it was kind of eerie. There was no crowd reaction. The commentators were obviously like crazy, but besides that, it was silent. And Francis is just sitting there over a dead body, just like staring down to make sure he comes back to life. It was so, it was creepy to watch that. It was like playing a video. It looked like a video game you're playing against like your little brother where he's like not nearly as good as you and you just school him. Like, that's what it looked so, like. I mean, it, it was like he just shut the lights off. Yeah. That was Jardino scary. Jardino also slips three right hooks before he gets KO. And he's throwing leg <laughs> kicks. He's th- going backwards yeah. throwing leg kicks. Francis is just through all the whole game plan out the window and just charges a dude and just starts throwing bombs. That was fucking crazy. Is that is that the fastest knockout he's got now? 20 seconds or was who is who is faster? I think that might be his fastest that's, knockout now. Yeah, that's got to be the fastest. Because I know he knocked out Kane and, like, it wasn't Kane. And then I think Curtis Blades, it had to be within the first minute. But he's got some crazy stat. I think all of his knockouts have ended in a combined total of, like, two minutes and five seconds or something stupid. It's crazy. I think, like, I think since the uh, Derek Lewis fight, he has something like, I think he has six or seven knockouts and like 
15 total minutes of cage time. So freaking crazy. Um, what did you think about the production as a whole? Obviously, there was a lot of things different. What were your kind of initial reactions and feedback from watching it? I felt like it was a very, uh, felt like a normal UFC pay-per-view, honestly, to me. Yeah. Like, I, I thought they did a great job with having the announcers separate. I thought um, the walkouts were great. You know, they still did all the stuff in the arena, which was cool. Um you know, the octagon girl is always kind of bizarre when it's like the same one over the and lone, over again. The lone and... octagon girl. Yeah, like that's Br- always Brittany a little bizarre, Palmer was but... killing it this weekend. Killing it. But I, I thought I thought it was I thought it was very well done from a production standpoint. Okay. Um obviously we talked about it a little bit, but I mean really the only the hiccup they had was the Jacare situation and besides that, I mean from everything I've heard and listened to, I I think they handled the pandemic situation as best as possible. Yeah. And I think the thing about the UFC is like, it's very hard to be first, right? I think a lot of these leagues are trying to figure it out. You see the NFL, NBA, you know, college football, uh, baseball, all trying to figure this out. Like this is not, this stuff is not easy. It's not easy to figure out how to do this. And like at the end of the day, you know, they're not just, here they're not entertaining us for charity like they need to make money too and you know they're trying to figure out how to do this all safely so i think in in general i thought that the ufc did a really good job i I do think there's a couple areas of improvement so i gave them like a seven out of ten for this weekend yeah and i think they're you know they're going to take a lot from this weekend and apply it to tomorrow's card and saturday you know but i i was listening to i think john morgan today on submission radio and he was saying like the hotel, like everything about the whole weekend was completely locked down. Like there was no socializing within the hotel. You had a wristband. It, you had to change it every day after you got tested to make sure, you know, everything was secure and everyone was pop or, you know, didn't have the Corona. He said everything was locked down and they kept, you know, a tight watch on anyone that was involved with the event. So that's good to hear. I, I think they're going to probably run into, you know, a couple more Jacare situations. You know, I think it's just inevitable, but I mean, besides that, everything was awesome. Yeah, you know, I I was a yeah, little I, I, little let's... worried that they were gonna freak out and someone was gonna cancel the card after that. But once we got to Saturday morning and there was none of that, I I, I knew it was all gonna go on, you know, as planned. Let's let's dive into the Jacare situation a little yeah. bit because I, I actually think it's like very preventable from from the UFC standpoint where this doesn't happen. And pretty easy, Parker. Just test them earlier in the week. If if Jacare had gotten that test 24 hours earlier, he never goes to weigh in. Yeah, he's yeah. isolated in the hotel. Like, I think a lot of the guys the didn't. A lot of the guys didn't get there till like midweek. Like, I don't think Dominic Cruz or Justin Gaethje got there till like Wednesday. You need to get them there earlier, like, and you need to test them earlier and you need to keep them isolated, you know, until you can get test results back. But here's the thing, like, these are MMA fighters. The history of this sport is guys lying to the commission and the promoters about in- injury. Like, w- COVID-19 is not any different in that respect. Like, fighters are going to fight. They- they're they're going to do everything they can to make sure that they get a- get to the cage. And especially a guy like Jock Ray, who it seemed like was pretty asymptomatic. Um, you know, he's not going to come out and say like, oh, I think I may have coronavirus. So I think trusting them that they're going to be safe about this is kind of a fool's errand. And we just need to get them out there testing earlier because ultimately, you know, the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, Major League Baseball, like all these leagues, part of what they're trying to figure out right now is How can we maintain competition where if one person tests positive, it doesn't derail everything for us? So every sports league is going to have contingency plans about how they can do this. How, you know, if that situation comes up, how are they going to handle it? So, you know, it's not like like all these people saying that the UFC should have canceled that event because of Jacare. I wonder if they're going to say the same thing when it happens in the NBA, when it happens in the NFL. Like, Because those leagues are going to proceed as well. They're not going to cancel stuff. They're going to isolate the infected person, and they're going to have a protocol. So 
I think the UFC just needs to make a slight tweak to its protocol and, and they can figure a lot of stuff out. Yeah. Do you think they'll do away with the weigh-ins or the face-offs? Cause that, I mean, that, that was pretty much the only time that the fighters interacted. Besides that, I think every fighter had its own, you know, workout room with sauna and, you know, whatever they needed to cut weight. So, I mean, that was really the only time they gathered was at the face-off and, I don't even think that's necessary if if they're going to roll the dice on someone getting it. Yeah, I think I mean it's kind of I feel the similarly about the face off and the post fight interviews. Um, I, I just which they kind of threw that out like, the window. They just kind of yeah. Joe Rogan was just like, I'm not doing that. Well, he looked kind of. It was weird. I didn't think he was going to interview anyone, and I think maybe the first the Ryan's the Ryan span Sam Avi fight maybe he did an interview, or he skipped. No, he did it. Well, he skipped one in between, and I was like, did he just get told he can't do interviews? And then he came back to normal. It was very strange. But I, I just think, you know, if fighters want to kind of, like, opt out of that or say that they want to do it, like, at a distance, like, you can't force them into it. And, like, Dana White's, like, fist-bumping Jacare out there, right? Like, I, I just think, like, he's, you know, clearly him and Rogan don't don't feel any risk from this, but... Well, I think um, Rogan made the point. He was like, look, we've been, we've all been tested three times. We're all positive, you know? And, and I think that was kind of his stance. He's like, everyone that's fighting is positive. All the announcers are positive. Negative. negative. They're all negative. Negative, negative, whatever. Okay. Sorry. My bad. Negative. They don't have the, the COVID. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I thought they did a great job. Yeah. I think it'll carry on. Did you see the guy? There was one guy, he must have been a cameraman or something, that was standing by the tunnel where they did the walkouts, and he was, like, slapping high fives, and I think he caught someone's hat or something. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. All right. Look, um, I, like I said, I think slight tweaks in there, they got it just no, about as close to perfect as you no, can. No, they'll, they'll figure it out. And two weeks from now, they'll figure it out, and I don't think they'll have any more issues. But um, what were your thoughts on, there was a lot made of the commentators you know, basically the fighters being able to hear the commentators in the corner. Um, what what were your thoughts on that? And do you think that's something that they'll have to change? Do you see that as any sort of advantage or not really? No, I loved it. I loved it. I think it's fun. I like, I kind of think there's like a new dimension to these fights. And like, I love that they were kind of acknowledging it after the fight was over that he was here in Daniel Cormier, you know, Greg Hardy saying that he's here in Daniel Cormier. Um, the thing DC was saying that I think is really funny is they wear those big tan earphones and those are designed so you could still hear in an arena, 20,000 screaming people. So when the arena is empty, you can't hear anything. He's yelling. So I think that's kind of hilarious, but I have no problem with it. I mean, whatever, like, you know, if, if Daniel Cormier is giving a guy corner advice and he beats you because of it, like that's kind of on you in my opinion, like, it, it, you know, your corner's not in there fighting for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, besides, I, I liked it personally. It was like, I don't know. I just liked it. It was more intimate. You could hear all the shots. You could hear the fighters breathing. You could hear the corner advice. Like listening to Trevor Whitman in between rounds with the Justin Gaethje fight, that was really cool. You know, normally you would get maybe a couple seconds of whatever he was saying, but I mean, you basically listened to the whole break in between rounds and the strategy throughout the fight. I thought that was pretty cool. So I, I would think we're probably going to get this for the rest of the year. And I mean, I liked it. I, I thought it was pretty cool, especially for, I like I like the no fans because uh, it allows the fighters and the referees to dictate the fight. Like so often on these fight cards, like we get frustrated because the ref breaks up a clinch or stands fighters up when like uh -huh. clearly he's going for a position. And uh -huh. it's usually because the fans are booing. Right. And, and I just think, like, I, I really like that, uh, that you know, they let kind of these guys grapple and, and let the fight progress how it's supposed to. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think everything went on as planned. They can make little, you know, little changes here and there to get it better. But um, it was awesome. I, I agree with you. I think that's got to be for sure the best fight card of 2020. Um, I mean, when we look back on this, the UFC's first card back, I think four or five years from now, this is going to be a memorable card because, I mean, it was 
fucking badass from start to finish. Every single fight was awesome. I was watching it with, you know, myself and my whole family. And, you know, I'm the only one that's a super, super hardcore fan. The rest of them are, you know, casuals. They know Conor McGregor. They know the big names. But literally my mom watched from Sam Alvey to the main event. <laughs> like, was glued to the TV. It was it was really cool. Um, I think they did a great job. Um, the pay-per-view numbers, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, early, n- early news today said it's going to be around 700K. I want to see if you had any thoughts on that. It it felt really big. I mean, it wasn't just MMA Twitter. It was Instagram, normal, casual Twitter. Everything was talking about the UFC. So what's interesting to me about that 700K number, because, like, I I believe that. Like, the, the buzz that this generated and the the interest that I was getting from, you know, sports fans who aren't necessarily MMA fans, it felt like, similar to, you know, your John Jones pay-per-view or not quite a Conor McGregor card, but like a, maybe a level below that. But the TV ratings for the prelims were about the same as they were for UFC 248. So I'm wondering if they converted at a much higher rate where people bought the pay-per-view because they wanted something else to continue doing that night or if people were watching the prelims through other means or what, or they skipped the prelims and just watched the pay-per-view. Um, but that 700 K number for me felt right. And then when I looked at the TV ratings for the prelims, I was kind of like, huh, that's odd. So that's, that's kind of, well, I mean, on the on prelims, that. like a lot of casual fans wouldn't know probably anyone besides Cowboy, you know, Cowboy, maybe Anthony Pettis. Um, so, I mean, I could see it, but I, I just, I don't know. The main event, the main car just felt really big. It was like everyone was fucking talking about it. I had people messaging me all night, all day about it. Like, wow, these fights are amazing. This is incredible. And it's, unless you, you know, it's a Conor McGregor fight or, you know, a big fight, you don't really get that a lot. So, I don't know. I, I hope it did well. I didn't, I, I never watched regular ESPN. How is the coverage on normal ESPN? Like the, you know, did they do highlights or interviews or anything afterwards? Yeah, they had they had Dana White on today. He was talking about the Cejudo retirement and Justin Gaethje against Habib. And then they had, before the fights, they had Cejudo on and they had Ariel Hawani on and they had Brett Okamoto on. Um, I thought they did a really good job. Um, and, th- and they've covered it really well. Um, so it definitely got buzz. I don't know. I, I felt like a really big card to me. Um, I was, I was actually surprised that the prelim number more so than I was at the pay-per-view buy number. Yeah. I, I think it's going to keep getting buzz. When, when's the next pay-per-view they're going to do? Cause I know they have the next, the uh, next... June 6th, I think. So they're just going to roll out fight nights until then. Oh Yeah. So is it still going to be three, two to three cards a week? I don't know how long they're going to do the two to three cards a week. Yeah. Um, but I think they're going to this. The weekly schedule started again for the UFC. Yeah. Um, OK, what else we got? Um, all right. The constant tweets. I that got a little annoying. How, what did you what were your feelings on so the constant like tweets? The tweet. Yeah. Yeah. I like it because I especially think with I think this card attracted a lot of people who are sp- like general sports fans. So I think getting like your Christian McCaffrey's and Patrick Mahomes and Tom like, Brady and NBA NFL yeah. guys. What? Yeah. I think Tom Brady was on there too, wasn't he? Yeah, Tom Brady like getting those guys on there talking about the card. I think it kind of made a lot of more casual fans like feel like this was a big moment in sport, which yeah. I think is an important thing for the UFC to do. You have Stephen A. Smith calling Justin Gaethje Garth. Did you see that? God. I, I, I have seen actual like MMA commentators not be able to pronounce Gaethje. So that's not what I'm going to get on Stephen A. For. <laughs> you think that's a Siri uh, autocorrect for Gaethje is just Garth? I think Steven is just a huge Garth Brooks fan, so it just <laughs> autocorrects because he's always texting and tweeting about him. He was listening to Thunder Rolls, and then he turned on the UFC. Um, 
All right, so let me see. The last thing I want to talk to you about was the paydays. Um, Tony had a great payday. He got five hundred grand. Let me pull these up. I thought these were kind of interesting. Um, so we had Tony led the way at five hundred thousand. Um, Justin came in at four hundred fifty thousand. He had three fifty to show, and then he or show and win, I guess. And then he had the hundred thousand dollar fight of the night bonus. Um, three fifty for Cejudo, three hundred for Dominic Cruz, three ten for twenty seconds for Francis Ngannou. That's pretty fucking awesome. I would go get knocked out in 20 seconds for 80 grand that Rosenstruck got too. Um, so those are kind of the highlights. Um, Cowboy, does Cowboy have a deal where he just gets like a $200,000 flat rate to fight and fights like yeah, yeah, he does. four or five times a year? That's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, besides that, I mean, nothing I mean, good payday for Tony. I, I would think that's probably one of the Here's best. Here's my takeaway, Parker. You look at that, most of these people are making six figure. Like a yeah. lot of that card made six figures. In boxing, we always hear, and I'm a big MMA fighters are underpaid, right? But in boxing, you always hear about these huge paydays, and you always hear about how MMA guys want to go over to boxing because of the big paydays. Never in the history of professional boxing has a undercard or prelim fighter made a six figure payday. Never. I it's mean, never happened. Your boy Alexi Olenek, the Russian dad with the jean shorts, made one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So yeah, I mean, seems like the the pays were pretty solid for everyone. Um, all right, anything else on the card overall, and then we'll jump into. Let's talk about fights, Parker. Come let's on, get, man. Let's get I'm into sick it. Of talking about all this administrative stuff. We're not production experts here. All right, um, Justin versus Tony. It was a great fight. I went back and rewatched it. Um, for at first glance, I I thought, I really thought Justin just dominated from start to finish. I had Tony winning the second round, and then I had Justin just pretty much dominating, ten nine, maybe some ten eights in there. Round one, three, four, and five. Um, the second watch, I went back and watched it. It was a little closer than I thought, but I mean, still an incredible performance by Justin. Um, what were your initial thoughts after watching it the first go around and, you know, just of where Justin's at right now? Yeah, I had uh, I had Justin winning uh, one, three and four, obviously heading into the fifth round where he finished Tony. Um, I had Tony winning two. I thought the first round, like I thought it was a, a 10, nine, like a win for Justin, but I thought it was actually pretty close. Um I thought the second round was really close. Um, I actually thought the second round, Justin was winning until the very end when he got clipped. And I think you had to give it to Tony. Yeah, but I think Justin really started to pull away in the third and fourth, which, uh, you know, shows that we know it's the exact situation, right, that we said we couldn't see happening where yeah. we thought if it, if it went longer, then, you know, Tony would uh, drag Justin into the deep waters. But it just got to a point where, it felt like Justin realized that he could take Tony's best shot. And if he traded with Tony, eventually he would win because Justin was clearly hurting Tony. I mean, Tony Ferguson doesn't move back for anything. And in those third and fourth, especially he was getting stunned by some of those big power hooks. Yeah. It was freaking unbelievable. So a lot of talk, like, you know, everyone that I talked to about this fight was like, you know, even if you hadn't seen Tony fight and didn't know his background, everything that he's accomplished in the sport, like how tough is this guy? Is Tony walked through hell for five rounds. I mean, he literally, like no bullshit, he probably took 20 to 25 shots that would have knocked out almost anyone in the division and just kept coming. Tony is, Tony, we said it last week, Tony's the boogeyman. I didn't think anyone could put Tony away. And Justin was able to do it over five. It was very, very impressive. Very impressive. And and that's the thing, right? I mean, Tony is out there. Look, he looks like a Terminator. I mean, literally a Terminator where it's like you hit him and he kind of like does the flinch back and then walks forward again. And like for Justin to finish him for me is such a uh, compliment to Trevor Whitman, because in order to beat Tony, you have to be patient and you have to keep on that game plan and keep looking looking at the things that you saw on film 
over and over and over again for basically 25 minutes because it's all about Justin slipping Tony's punches and countering, slipping and countering the whole fight. That's what it was about. And that takes such discipline. And so hats off to Trevor Whitman and, and Justin Gaethje because that was clearly a, a masterful game plan. Well, um, and you saw, not, I think, was that, after the, was that after the third, the second or the third, where he was like, just take 10% off and just make contact. That's all you have to do. Just take 10% off of every strike and make contact. Because Justin was hitting him over and over again with straight rights, left hooks. Um, yeah, I mean, Trevor Whitman, we talked about this last week, but that dude, he's freaking incredible. And him and Justin are a perfect fit. That's, you know, that that's one of the best matchups probably currently between coach and fighter that we have in the UFC right now. And they just seem like they have something going on. So I'm going to be really looking forward to seeing what they do next. So let's um, let's jump into it. So for you, what did Justin do so well to take out Tony Ferguson? It's it's the patience thing, right? It's it's the. Justin was able to in, in in the past, right? Like in the in the Justin that fought, you know, Poirier and Alvarez and Michael Johnson and fought in World Series of Fighting. Whenever he would get hit, he would counter with four and five punch combos, and the guy would swing back with one, and Justin come back with five more, and then he'd get into a brawl because when you fight that style, that's that's the fight you're asking for. What he has done with Trevor Whitman is when he gets hit with one. He slips that one or blocks that one and comes back with two, but they're hard, they're accurate, they're pinpoint strikes, they're very precise. I mean, and that's patience, that's game planning, that's understanding your opponent, understanding what he's throwing at you, and being able to pick the exact strike to hit him with that's going to hurt him the most with that singular strike. And his transformation in, from a, a brawler to... This very technical striker is is really unbelievable. Yeah, I would almost say this is Justin Gaethje 3.0. We had the 1.0 that was, you know, World Series of Fighting in his first couple of fights, Michael Johnson, Dustin Poirier, Eddie Alvarez in the UFC, where it's just stand and bang and he's going to break you. 2.0 was a little, you know, little cut back on that, a lot more patient and picked his shots better, but, you know, it was still pretty aggressive. This one was fucking amazing. I mean, for me, the power punching's there. That's his biggest strength. But he's able to pace that over five rounds. We saw that. If you can last five rounds with Tony Ferguson, I think you can last five rounds with anyone in the lightweight division. Because Tony puts a pace on that. I mean, we'll have to see with, with Khabib's wrestling, but I, I don't think anyone else is going to put a pace on like Tony can. Uh, for me, the head movement was incredible. He was doing like... Mike Tyson, Bob and Weave stuff. He's like, you know, ducking like a foot from the ground. The head movement was incredible. He would make a miss and then, like you said, hit him with two or three punches. Um, the accuracy and the timing of Justin Gaethje. He has kind of, it's kind of the Conor McGregor-esque timing. Like, that dude finds the exact right time to hit you with the most violent force, and it's perfect. I mean, he's just... He, he's figured it out. And then um, I agree the discipline fighting. Like, I think Trevor had to reel him in a little bit, like we said, after the second or the third round, because I think he was getting a little bit in that brawl mo mode and he was just wanting to kill Tony and knock him out in the second round. And I think Trevor Whitman knew that, you know, that was not realistic. He was going to have to fight him over four to five rounds, you know, to eventually get the finish. And then um, the leg kicks, the leg kicks are still there. Um, he didn't use them as much as he did in you know his previous UFC fights, but they're still there. They're still dangerous. Tony took a lot of damage to the legs. So, yeah, I mean, I think the one thing we didn't see was the wrestling. There was no takedown attempts at all. I think Tony had the one uh, Eminari roll in like the fourth or fifth round, but it was, you know, far out and, you know, not a great attempt. So I think if he does get ma matched up with Khabib, that's going to be the big question is, you know, where is his wrestling? And then can he keep that cardio up over five rounds in a grappling match, basically? Because, I mean, he's proved to me, at least, that, you know, if you can go in there and fight a stand-up fight with Tony Ferguson for five rounds and not gas and look like you could go another five, that was pretty impressive. Yeah, I, uh, I'm much more excited for this Justin versus Khabib fight than I've probably ever been because of this performance. I just think... 
he looks so much more polished in there as a fighter. And, and I finally, like it was, I was able to finally see like, okay, this guy has the technical skill to compete with Habib Nurmagomedov. It's not just, well, Justin pressures forward, Justin super tough, Justin hits hard. Like, no, like there was actual technical martial arts skill that was on display in this fight more than ever, more than we've ever seen before from Justin Gaethje. And that made me think, okay, this guy can give Habib a fight. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, all right, let's talk about Tony. To me, um, from the jump, he, he looked just a little slow, a little slow, uh, maybe a step behind. And a lot of that could have been Justin. Um, I just want to see what you thought about that. He just, he didn't look like he was in his flow. Like he usually is when Tony Ferguson gets cooking and flowing. I mean, there's, he's, he's a special fighter. It just looked like he never really got into that rhythm. And a lot of it was probably cause he took, you know, 20 to 25 bombs to the face that slowed him down and he couldn't get in a rhythm. Anytime he walked into the pocket, Justin was just unloading. So what did you think of Tony's performance and what did we see different, you know, than we normally see from Tony? Um, I think the, the threat of the grappling didn't feel present to me, uh, especially in the early rounds. I mean, I, I think Tony could beat a lot of guys in MMA starting with them and his closed guard. Like, I, I think he's that good on the ground. And it felt like he really wanted to stand straight up and bang with Justin, which I, I think played into Justin's hand a little bit. And then as far as being a little, maybe a step slow, I think Tony's style is so dependent on the other guy throwing and missing or throwing and connecting, but not hurting Tony at all. And then Tony kind of counter punches and, and that's how he gets into the flow when he starts to figure out your timing. And what was happening is Tony was losing a lot of those exchanges that he normally wins. So he would come in and he would throw and he would try and bait Justin and Justin would crack him. And then Tony's, Tony's flow was thrown off. Tony's timing was thrown off. So I, I think he never really got into Justin's timing and, and never really, you know, found the style of fight that, that suited him. And I think we talked a lot about Justin needing to make it chaos, but maybe Tony was the one who needed the chaos all along. And that never really came. It was a very kind of calculated fight for me. No, you're right. I mean, I noticed that like round two or three, but literally Tony was walking him down the whole fight. He was coming after him the whole fight, but every time he got into boxing range, Justin just fucking cracked him and, you know, made him take a stagger back. So yeah, that was awesome game plan by uh, Justin. Um, any issues with the stoppage? I, I didn't have any. I thought it was beautiful. It was brilliant by Herb Dean. Um, you know, obviously there was controversy in the co-main event, but I, I think that was the best thing that could happen for Tony. Yeah, and, and when you see a guy kind of take a shot like that and look away and, like, not kind of immediately turn back and face his opponent, like, you know something's up. Um, you know he's he's kind of not not right and not in his right mind. And um, you could tell Tony got really frustrated with Justin when Justin tried to come up with him, come up to him initially. You could tell he was really out of it because like almost immediately afterwards, he hugged him and said it was a great fight and, and everything. So um, I, I thought it was a great stoppage by Herb Dean. Very veteran stoppage. Yeah, I think he broke his orbital in the fight, but that that last punch, I think it was an overhand, but Tony looked away and then like shook his head. Um, and that's what I knew. I was like, you got to stop this fight. Cause I mean, one or two more of those unanswered shots that could have been vicious, especially from Justin, Justin Gaethje. So, uh, all right for Tony, obviously we talked about this last week. Um, it's hard not to feel for Tony. He took a big gamble here and he lost, you know, he was on a 12 fight win streak in the best division in MMA and never got a shot at the real title. So for Tony, what what do you think is next for him? So I got three guys kind of in order. This is who I want to see him fight. My my number one is is Dustin Poirier. I think that's almost a perfect fight. Um, and they've they've never fought before, so that's a good one. Second one I'd like to see Paul Felder. Both coming off losses, and Paul's always asked for Tony Ferguson, so I think that would get both of them excited. And then the third one I had, and you know this kind of far probably far down the list for me, but Dan Hooker, I think would be a stylistically fun fight. Um, 
you know, he's kind of near that top of, of that division. And I think if he were to beat Ferguson, he would earn a title shot. Um, and then I think if Ferguson wins, he's, he's basically right back in that number one contender slot. So no, those I are agree. my three guys. I had the same. Did I miss anybody? No, I had the same top two. I had Dustin number one. I think that makes, you know, a lot of sense. Number two, Paul Felder, um, fun fight a guy that's going to come forward. That'll be an action fight. Um, Number three that I really like is Charles Oliveira. I think stylistically, that would be a super fun fight. They're both super unorthodox, you know, kind of weird fighters. They do weird stuff. The ground game, ground game jiu-jitsu is phenomenal from both of those guys. Um, Charles Oliveira is coming off a win against Kevin Lee. So, I mean, he's got to be somewhere around the top five-ish. Um, and he's a guy that would be down to fight. So, him, uh, outside chance... Very, very outside chance, but Nate Diaz. I think that would be a very, very fun fight for Nate Diaz to come back to. And that's a fight that Nate Diaz is kind of on this kick where either he's going to take a big money fight or he's going to fight someone that's been around forever and that he respects. And I think Tony Ferguson would be a guy that he respects. Um, So that would be an interesting fight. Outside chance there, but um, those were my four. Um, Any chance that you see Tony just hang it up and retire? You know, always a chance in this sport. Tony's 37, you know, and and this is probably toughest loss of his career. But I don't think it's likely. It's not something I foresee happening. But, um, you know, it, it obviously could happen. Yeah. Um, for As for Tony and Khabib, um, I personally don't think we're going to ever see it again. Um, you know, I think it's going to be one of those things like, GSP, Anderson Silva, you know, Fedor, Brock Lesnar. It's just going to be one that got away. I mean, they literally, the UFC did everything in their power to book this fight over the last five years, and it just never worked out. So I don't think we're ever going to see it. If we do, it's going to be a diminished version. It's going to be Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather, five years after it was supposed to happen. Your thoughts on that? I think we're going to get it. I think we're going to get it. I think if Khabib beats Justin, he's going to ask for Tony. I think if Tony gets one more win, you know, he's right there back at the top of that division. Um, I think we're going to get it. I do. All right. Um, What else we got here? Um, Let's just talk the general ascension of Justin Gaethje. Does that's, the ascension of Justin Gaethje and just how good he has gotten, how good he performed in that fight has seemed to kind of overshadow the sadness or <laughs> around not being able to get Tony versus Khabib. Um, your thoughts on that? I, I just, I think that Justin just put on an incredible performance and I think he shocked a lot of people. A lot of people I heard talking in media today, Luke Thomas, the submission radio guys, um, Brandon Schaub, all of them. I think we're in the same boat as us. You know, they didn't think Justin could go five rounds with Tony, and he absolutely did and dominated pretty much the whole fight. Yeah, I uh, I agree. I, I think I never would have predicted it. I have been a fan of Justin Gaethje since World Series of Fighting. I, I never saw this coming to fruition. Mm-hmm. You know, I... Uh, I thought after the Eddie Alvarez thing, it was like, okay, Justin's kind of exposed. I think he'll get beat a couple more times and then he'll retire. Um, This is pretty unbelievable. I'm really excited for him to eventually fight Habib um, and kind of looking forward to, uh, to, you know, what the future holds for him. Because I I just think I, I, I don't, I don't see a way that anyone really beats Justin Gaethje at this point. But then again, I would pick Khabib if they fought. So well, that leads like, me. In, that leads me into my unstoppable force. Yeah, that leads me into my next question. What are your thoughts on the early matchup with Khabib and Justin? Because Dana went on. I think he was on ESPN today saying that he wants to book that. You know, late summer. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I think that's a great fight. I think it's two guys who come forward, two guys who are great wrestlers. Um, you know, I think Justin has a big edge in the striking. I think Khabib has maybe the only chin in MMA that's better than Tony Ferguson's. Um, I don't know if anyone's chin ever is better than Tony Ferguson. That was yeah, unbelievable. Maybe not, but I, 
I want to see that fight. I, I think it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, all right. So the Irishman, Conor McGregor, went on a fucking rampage on the entire roster. What were your thoughts on that? We'll have to post a link or something for all the tweets because it's he went fucking crazy. But he started by, I think he got into it first with Nate Diaz. And they were kind of going back and forth about basically him telling Nate, hey, you know, sign the contract. And what did he tell him to blink his eye or something? Cl- close his eyelid or something? Um, and then he sets his sights on pretty much the whole division and then kind of finishes up with Justin Gaethje. And then today follows up, you know, basically saying that he's going to get a lightweight title fight in July. I I have no idea what to think. I think they're trying to book the Nate fight. I think they've been trying to book the Nate fight. I think they want Connor to be the debut fight on Fight Island, which I think would sell massive pay-per-view just for the novelty of the Connor McGregor pay-per-view on Fight Island. I mean, like, everyone buys that. Um, And I just think, I I, I think he is kind of like back on his bullshit with, just these like scathing critiques of his opponents, like very personal, very well researched, like well written, like and just on a rampage on the internet, just taking people down. Like it's like vintage Connor. It's like so yeah. old school Connor. We got humble Connor for one fight camp. Now it's back to just ruthless animal Connor. I kind of like it. I I think if him. I, whoever he gets booked against, if it's against Justin or Khabib, um, obviously Justin and Khabib have the same manager, Ali, who, you know, him and Connor don't get along. So I, I think both of those fights would have a pretty nasty buildup. Um, it'd be interesting to see. It's obviously, it's not going to be the same. They're not going to go on a world tour, you know, like they've done in the past with Connor, um, uh, because of the Corona, but it'll be interesting. Um, I think, I think we get Connor in June or July. I really do. I think it's the Nate fight. I really think it's the Nate fight. Yeah, I think Connor's yeah. going to talk about it as if it's the lightweight championship of the world. Yeah. No, I, I could see that too. But um, I think that's the best fight to make. I, I think you got to keep order. You have to book Justin versus Khabib. Justin earned it. He came in, beat Tony Ferguson, the boogeyman of the division. He earns the fight to be the best lightweight on the planet against Khabib. Um, yeah, Connor, Connor, Nate, Fight Island. Are you kidding me? July, let's fucking do it. Throw John Jones on there. Let's get crazy. But um, how much money? How much money would you pay to be in attendance at Connor versus Nate uh, on Fight yeah, Island in the empty Island Arena? You don't want to know, Billy. I, I would pay a lot of money to be there. If I could hang out, maybe smoke a joint or two with Nick Diaz, and then go on the on the drink with uh. Connor, it would be fucking awesome. But um, they should do that. They should definitely do that. Fight Island should be good to go by then. Uh, but I'm thinking July for Connor. And then after that, you get, you know, September, August, you get Justin versus, versus Khabib. And then I would assume Connor gets the winner of that. Um, all right, let's move on. Connor is obviously ready to go. It seems like he's getting back in a fight camp and he's getting ready to go and take on. Whoever, he pretty much called out everyone. The whole division, and then he also called out everyone at 170. So, um, after watching that fight, who do you think right now matches up better against Khabib? Tony or still still Tony or Justin? Justin Gaethje. It is. It's Justin. It's How can you deny him at this point? I mean, yeah. I still think prime Tony Ferguson matches up better than Justin does right now, but Justin can match the pressure. You know, he's an all American division one wrestler. That's about, you know, other than being an Olympian, that's about as good as it gets. Um, you know, and, and his striking has gotten so much better. I, I just think, I think that's a really good fight. I, I, that's a hard one to pick. Yeah, it's a great fight. Um, all right, let's move on. That was Tony Ferguson. You're the man. Awesome run. He'll be back. I think Tony, Tony's 37. 36, 37, but I still think he's got probably two or three good years left of fighting in him. He's just a freak show. Um, and for Justin, unbelievable performance. Fucking incredible. 
Um, all right, let's move on. Billy's favorite fighter on the card, King Henry, retains his bantamweight belt against Dominic Cruz. Um, I've got my Dominic Cruz shirt on. Uh, that was hard to watch. I was pulling for Dom so hard. And Henry Henry had a great game plan to me. Um, you know, first watch, Henry just came in there, basically neutralized Dom's movement, with, which is his biggest strength, and was just blowing through his legs. He was just sitting there waiting for him. Anytime Dom got in range, just blew through both of his legs. So you had never really seen anyone, you know, beat up Dom's legs like that. I think that slowed him down. And then obviously the second round he gets caught with, which was, I think it was a body kick, but Dom kind of ducked down and caught his knee. And then, um, man, Henry finished the fight. So what were your, what were your initial thoughts on watching that fight? Henry is so good, like, in that finishing sequence. He just gets that referee's position in wrestling where he gets the far hip and he controls the guy and, like, has all his weight centered on the guy so he can't stand up, but your head is open, and he just lands lefts or rights on you, whatever side he's on, and just finishes fights from that exact position masterfully. He's so good at it. Like, it's like a typical folk-style wrestling position that he's just adapted for MMA for those fight finishing sequences. And he just bludgeoned Dom. Yeah. The the, the first shot after he hit him with the knee and Dom was staggered and falling down. I mean, Henry hit him just flush like immediately right on the chin. And I was like, Oh fuck it's over. Cause I mean, Dom's usually a guy, Dom gets rocked and he'll recover. Um, But yeah, man, Henry, when he hurts you, he, he finishes fights better than I think anyone in MMA. He's the instincts he has for finishing fights is unbelievable. So other than Francis, well, Francis it only takes one, <laughs> not thirteen. If Francis hit someone thirteen times, they'd be dead. So yeah, um, it'd be like a cartoon where there's just like a pile of dust, just, like Homer after Simpson. like Marvin the Martian vaporizes someone. Jesus. Um. So yeah, and then after Henry retires, um. Which I I want to see how you feel about this, and then I'll tell you what I'm thinking. But um, a, you think it was for real, and b, if he does retire, what is King Henry's legacy in MMA? So I I think Henry can retire today and be a Hall of Famer. I mean, he beat Dominic Cruz, he beat DJ, TJ Dillashaw, he beat uh, Mighty Mouse. You know, he held held belts in two divisions. He defended those belts in two divisions. I believe he's the first double champ. And he's definitely the first male double champ to defend belts in two divisions. I think. Yeah. I think Amanda Unless, did it, right? And Cormier did it. Yeah. Cormier didn't do it against John um, Jones. That's not real. But, like, so, you know, he has that. And he's beat, you know, his resume is great. I mean, his losses are really only to Benavidez and uh, Mighty, Mouse. Mighty Mouse. Yeah. So he's got a really elite re- uh, resume. So I think he could be a Hall of Famer today. Um, I, ultimately, I think he's posturing for more money. I think, you know, this happens. Um, if the UFC pays him, he'll come back. But I think he could very well remain retired. I mean, you got to remember, this is a guy who won the gold medal in Olympic wrestling at 21 years old, was one of the best wrestlers in the world, and could have done two more Olympics and become one of the best American wrestlers ever. Yeah. And retired from the sport right. to pursue MMA. I didn't know that. So I, I, heard, uh, I heard DC say that on the broadcast. He's done it before. Um, yeah. You know, he says he wants to family wants to get into real estate like i could see henry cejudo just kind of walking away from fighting and and you know what like as much as i don't like the whole cringe act he's a great he's a great fighter and there's no denying that and he has a great resume and you know he could walk away with a hall of fame resume right now yeah i mean his last four wins tko dom cruz tko marlon marias tko tj dillashaw and then win a decision over you know one of the best fighters of all time Pretty fucking unbelievable. Uh, all right, that leads me to my next question. If he comes back, is there any chance we see him move up to 145 and go for a third belt? 
I, I just think 135 is so stacked, they're not going to just let the division sit there. So I think if he does that, like, it'll be similar to, like, when he when he uh, ditched the 125 belt and they just held it an open uh, vacant belt, um, vacant belt title fight. Like, I, I just don't see them holding up 135. Yeah. How long do you think until Dana... Strips him. You think there's an ultimatum? Is it 30 days? Is it two months? Because it seems like Dana wants to make the Peter Yawn fight against whoever. You know, Aljamain Sterling or Corey Sanhagen. The second they could get Yawn into the country, they'll strip Henry and they'll make whatever fight. Hmm. So you don't even think he gives them like 30 days to think about it or anything? or? No, I think he basically says you can fight Peter Yan or you can give up the belt. Yeah. Um, so if Henry does retire, what's next for the Bantamweight division? Henry actually in the post-fight conference brought up, you know, hey, they should do a four-man tournament, which I was totally down with. You know, what are your thoughts on well, that? Well, they already booked, they booked Sterling against Sanhagen for that June 6th pay-per-view. Oh, they did? Um. Yeah. So, or at least they're looking at it. So I think they just use that, you know, whoever wins Sterling versus Sanhagen fights Peter Yan for the vacant belt. I don't necessarily think you need to like involve Dom Cruz in perpetuity in these like title fight discussions. Like, let's be honest, like Dom Cruz didn't really deserve that title shot. He hasn't fought like anyone in years. Um, I just think, like, I think we need to move on as a division. And so, you know, if Dom Cruz wants to take another fight and get back on the horse and get back in the mix, I'm fine with it. But I don't need to see him in a four-man tournament to prove who the best bantamweight is. I want him and Corey Sanhagen. I don't know why, but I'm so down with that fight. I want him, Corey Sanhagen, then I want Peter Yan and Sterling. Four-man tournament. Let's go. Um all right, anything else? Uh, thoughts on the stoppage? Obviously, Dominic Cruz had a lot of issues with it. He was he was saying, uh, what's his name? Keith Peterson smelled like uh, booze and cigarettes. And, you know, he, he had asked him before the fight to basically, if he gets hurt, let him go out on his shield. He doesn't want it stopped early. It's a title fight. Um, thoughts on that? Obviously, we've seen Don recover in previous fights where he's been rocked and come back and... On second watch, you know, the first time I watched it, I was like, fuck, like he's going to go out if they don't stop this fight. Um, the second time I watched it, he was getting up to a knee, kind of getting himself up on the fence. I think he could have let it go another, you know, three, four seconds, maybe. But I want to see what your thoughts were on the stoppage. I think, I mean, Dom can, can obviously say whatever he wants. And I was glad that he clarified. I heard him today on Ariel's show saying that, He's not saying that that's the reason he lost. He's just, he's frustrated with that referee. And I guess he doesn't like his work in the past, whatever. To say someone who's like doing that kind of regulatory job smells of booze and cigarettes is like really unprofessional to me. I, I, I mean, it's not like Keith Peterson's just like allowed to go out there. Like they make sure that he's, you know, not drunk like when he's out there. So that's, I think it's crazy that he said that I was fine with the stoppage. Is it the best stoppage I've ever seen? No. Like, do I think he could have let it go a few more seconds? Yes. But like you said, in that moment, it felt like he was going to go out. He took about a dozen unanswered shots right to the head. Um, I, I just think, I, I think it was fine. I don't think it, it changed the outcome of the fight. And and I think Keith Peterson's a good referee, so I feel bad that um, Dom kind of came at him in, in a way that I, I don't think is fair or professional criticism. I mean, it's not really, that's not really Dom's personality, I don't think. He, I mean, generally, he's pretty professional, pretty, you know, keeps it, keeps it on the straight and narrow. <laughs> I think he was just pissed. You know, that was a big opportunity for him to insert himself back, get his belt back, and... You know, I think he feels like he was cheated of it. Um, that leads me to my next question. Do you think we'll see him back, or do you think Dom will hang it up? I I do think we'll see him back, and I would love I would love to see him against Frankie Edgar. That's like the number one fight I I want to see. Frankie Edgar, Dom Cruz, bantamweight. I think that's interesting. 
would also watch him against Jose Aldo. I think that's an interesting fight. Um, but I would rather see him fight a guy like that than, you know, come back and fight like a, uh, you know, Peter Yan or something like that. Like, I don't want to see Dom Cruz get beaten out of this sport. Like, I, I would rather see him, you know, do some of these more fun matchups and, you know, get back, get some momentum again. And, and you know, if he's still got it, then challenge for the belt. All right. Uh, Francis first. Francis just killing people. Uh, Francis versus Rosenstrike. Wow. That was unbelievable. Um, I will, I will declare not going a heavyweight after watching. No, I don't think so. I don't think anyone, (laughs) I don't think anyone wants to fight him. I want to see it, but I don't think anyone wants to fight him. Um, to me, Francis is the Mike Tyson of MMA. I mean, he's on a run right now where I don't think anyone wants to fight him. You're tuning in just to watch him knock people out. Um, I don't know. Here's that my was, thing. <laughs> Here's what I'm thinking while I'm watching this, right? Like, Francis, like, he's a knockout artist like we've never seen in heavyweight at MMA. We've never seen someone who's able to do it like Francis can. Like, even, like, when Fedor was going unbeaten, it wasn't like this. It didn't look like this. Um, and I just think what we've seen this in other divisions, right? Like, you know, like your Jose Aldo's and... um you know, guys who like can't be stopped. not to this like, level, not to this level, though. This is like this is freaky. This is Mike Tyson and but my thing Deontay is, Wilder, maybe. With all these guys, like when when they're knocking out everyone and they clean out their division, we just have a move up. Right. We go challenge her a second belt. Francis can't move up. There's no human being on this planet who can even like challenge this guy in a cage, in my opinion. I don't know what. All right, let's just get right into this. It, that was, that was freaky. That was that was bizarre. And just scary. Scary is what it was. Um, what's next for Francis? Uh, the heavyweight division kind of seems like it's on ice until DC and Stipe fight, and then after that, I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion. I I think both of those guys may hang it up after that. I don't think anyone wants to fight Francis. I think if either yeah. either guy wins, you might see both of them retire. And then what? Francis just is given the division? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, they should have done a long time ago. Just leave the belt and walk away. Like, he- I mean, he's going to be heavyweight Valentina Shevchenko, where it's like, we're just talking about how fast is he going to do this? It's crazy. I, I mean, I don't know. Um, DC came out, and I, I think on the, you know, on the broadcast, he was like, "There's no way I'm fighting this guy." And then he kind of walked it back, and he's like, "You know, of course I'll fight this guy if Stipe gives up the belt, which isn't going to happen." And to me, it would be a really bad look for the UFC if they strip Stipe of the belt because he's a first res- first responder and doesn't want to fight during the coronavirus or whatever. Um, so, what do you think's next for for Francis? Do we see him again this year? I mean, in all honesty, I think that we're going to see uh, DC Stipe probably in September. Uh, you know, I want to be optimistic and say August, but I think probably September. I mean, Francis Ngannou has gotten 20 seconds of work in over a year. Um, you know, I, I don't know what you do. I, don't, I genuinely don't. And I never say that. I always have a name for you. I always have a person like I don't know what you do. I mean, I'm. I'm fine if they want to do the Derek Lewis rematch. That's the only one that I'm thinking like, okay. But yeah. other than that, it's like, then you have to go down to like your Blagoy Ivanovs of the world. Yeah. I mean, um, that, I'll throw one, I'll throw one at you. And I, I am the number one fan for John Jones moving up to heavyweight, but I agree with you. I, I don't think he's moving up to fight Francis, especially if it's not for a belt. John's not rolling the dice for a non-title fight to go fight Francis. Um, Rumble Johnson is the one that comes to mind for me. I think he's someone that could come in. You could book that. I think he's actually in training camp. You could book that, you know, June or July. That could be on a Connor card. Francis versus Rumble Johnson. Fuck yeah. Sign me up. Take all my money for that. Um, I, I think that's really your only other option besides Black Beast. I think Black Beast obviously would step in and and take that fight again. He wasn't happy with how it went the first time. Um, so yeah, either Black Beast or Rumble. I think that's the next fight for Francis, and then after that, it's got to be title. 
Well, yeah. The other one that I was thinking is, and this is kind of dependent on him, uh, you know, taking a couple more fights here rather quickly and winning them. But if Greg Hardy strings a couple more together, I I could see them not, throwing him to the wolves. He's, he's not on the same level. There's no, no way. He's not. No, Greg Hardy would get starched, starched by Francis very, very quickly. Um, yeah, Francis is a freak show. They they got to keep him busy. There's no way you can put Francis and Ghanu on the shelf until after the DC Stipe fight. You know, I, I think I think you put him on a Conor McGregor card. If they're going to book Conor in July, you put Francis as a, as a co-main event, get a shitload of eyes on Francis, and then if DC and Stipe both decide to move on or retire, you know, I think Francis becomes your next big star, your heavyweight star, and he could rule that division for as long as he wants to. So Francis, very, very impressive. 20, 18 seconds technically, but very impressive. Um, all right. Calvin Cater versus Jeremy Stevens. Um, this kind of went the way we said it would be as a fast paced fight. You know, both guys are savages. Um, pretty much exactly how I thought yeah, it would go. Exactly how we said. Um, Calvin Cater what do you basically think about, just. Uh... Calvin Cater, so Edson Barbosa is going to fight Dan Ige on this right. card uh, coming up. I think it's yeah. tomorrow. Um, yeah, it is tomorrow. Calvin Cater versus the winner of that fight. Um, I want to see Calvin Cater versus Z- or Yair Rodriguez. I think that would be a fun fight. But uh, Edson Barbosa versus Calvin Cater, I don't know. I think Cal- Calvin Cater would knock him out. Calvin Cater, is he's fun fucking fight, vicious. Though. Yeah. There's a lot of fun fights at 145 right now. Um, Jeremy Stevens too. You feel for him. I mean, he's fought everyone. He he looked at decent, and then he just got caught with that fucking massive elbow, and Calvin Cater destroyed him when he went to finish him. I think he split him open with the elbow on the ground, and then he was vicious. Um, that dude's good. Stevens the fight to me is like uh, he's like poor man's cowboy. Fights all the time. He's fought yeah. everybody. Yeah. You know, he wins some, he loses some. Always yeah. exciting. Um, I just think at this point in his career, it kind of doesn't matter if Jeremy Stevens wins or loses. Like, no. I think no. he's drawn the same amount of eyeballs either way, same amount of interest either way. I want to see the fight I want to see is Calvin Cater versus Max Holloway. That's like my dream fight at 145. That would be an incredible striking match. Um, but I think he's probably won one or so one or two fights away from that. So yeah, big night for Calvin Cater. Um, another guy that I put was Korean zombie. I think that would be a fun fight. Calvin Cater versus Korean zombie. And yeah, I, I that's a good one. Yeah. I don't think they, they, they haven't booked Brian Ortega versus Korean zombie yet. Have they? They have not. I don't know that zombie can get out of Korea. That's a good point. After, uh, Brian Ortega slapped up the Korean pop star. All right, you, you want to go to the prelims? Yeah, Greg Hardy. Uh, we'll talk about Greg Hardy real quick. Uh, I can't ever, I, I can't ever take anything from a Greg Hardy fight. I think his footwork's a lot better. His head I thought moved, he moved a His lot boxing was fight. good, but it's just like, I don't know. I think he's got a long way to go to be a top five heavyweight. It's just not all there. He, you know, I think he'll compete with and beat a lot of guys from five to fifteen. But once you get into the Alice or Overeems, the Black Beast, the Francis Ngannou's, it's going to be tough. Or someone that will wrestle him, take him down. Curtis Blades, take yeah. him down and Greg beat Hart, the shit. Greg Hardy against yeah. uh, Fabrizio Verdum next. Book it. I want to see him fight that tough-ass Russian with the dad jorts. Oh, Olenek? Yeah, Olenek. Olenek was throwing bombs in round one. We'll talk. All right, let's move on to that. Um well, first, let's cover Cowboy. Cowboy um, Cowboy versus Pettis was pretty much what we thought it would be. Both of those guys came out. Yeah. They put, up, put on a good performance. Um, no losers. Very, very close fight. I actually, I thought Cowboy won that fight. Um, but for Cowboy, I think it was good to just get over the hump of the McGregor fight. To get back, put on a good performance. Um, fun fight. You know, not a lot of pressure. And I think he went out there and performed. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I had Cowboy winning two rounds to one. Um, but again, close fight. 
great performance from both fighters, honestly, I thought. Um, here are my two bookings out of this. I want to see Cowboy fight Damian Maya. I think that's perfect. Um, second fight out of this, uh, Anthony Pettis against Vincente Luque. That's a great fight. That 170, that's a good yeah. fight. <laughs> yeah, I'm down with that. Uh, how about Cowboy versus Diego Sanchez? I'd watch it, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would think watch that's that not too. A good night for Diego. No, I don't think so either. But no, I'm down with those two matchups. Um, good fight from those two guys. Two veteran guys put on good performance. Um, all right, Verdum versus Olenek. Olenek comes out throwing fucking bombs. I thought he was going to knock Verdum out in the first round. And then after that, he slowed a little bit. You know, Verdum started super, super rusty. He looked not in the best shape, and he just seemed slow. And I don't know. He landed some good bombs. Verdum some looked good... very bad. Yeah, it was not good. It was not good. He he had a Linux in some good positions on the ground, just couldn't really finish it. I, I don't know. I think the reality is that's a 42-year-old for Fabrizio Verdum that's been out for two years. Because of steroids that he now cannot take. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. That was a weird fight. Um, good win for Olenek. I mean, he's he's got to be coming towards the top five ish, right? I think he's like eight, seven or yeah. eight. Uh, yeah. Verdum, Verdum, I think has one fight left in the UFC, and like uh-huh. my guess is he fights it out and then goes to Russia where he could take steroids again and make more money. Yeah, or Bellator. I could see him being in the Bellator heavyweight division. Just kind of the legends division over there. But um all right. All right, this one was awesome. Vicente Luque versus Price. Um great fight. Both of those guys are fucking savages. Nico Price is like the wildest fighter. I mean, he's just like every fight he's in is crazy. He's he's uh, one seventy he's Tony he, he's he's Tony Ferguson of the one seventy division. That dude just Comes forward, scraps, tough as shit. Um, that was a great fight. That was an awesome fight to get us ready for the main card. But um, yeah, Vicente Luque looked good. I, I think he's just is a little more polished of a striker. He was just throwing straighter, straighter punches, and you know was able to eventually close up that eye and get Price out of there. But um, yeah, both of those guys won. You know, I, I, was that fight of the night? Uh no. Uh Gaethje Ferguson was fight of the night. Oof. Well that was that had to be the close second. That was awesome. Um all right. Our boy Bryce Mitchell gets his camo shorts. I'm gonna let you dive gets into the camo uh, shorts. Into the jiu-jitsu world and over here. Charles Rosa is a black belt under Ricardo Laborio, who's like a legend of jujitsu. Like he's a very, very legit black belt. Like I mean Bryce Mitchell dominated him on the ground. I want to see Bryce Mitchell against Crone Gracie. I think that's yeah. a perfect match. No, straight away, Crone, Crone Gracie or Ryan Hall. No one wants to fight Ryan Hall. You know crazy-ass Arkansas bred Bryce Mitchell would be down. Um, those, those are the two guys I want to see him fight. All right, Billy, we're back. UFC 249 in the books. What a great night. Awesome. Amazing. Awesome. Amazing. All right. All right. Uh, you want to hit Manscaped or do you want to dive right into uh, this week's cards? Support for Parker's MMA show is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in below the belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. I know, Parker, I've been using this guy, the Lawnmower 3 during the quarantine to make sure my man parts are freshly groomed while I'm stuck in my house. Their third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to prevent manscaping accidents. Millions of balls are about to be Nick free. Thanks to manscapes advanced skin safe technology. So if you're listening to me speak right now, I want you to experience it firsthand for yourself. Get 20% off and free shipping with promo code FIGHT. That's FIGHT, F-I-G-H-T, at manscaped.com. So 20% off, promo code FIGHT. They support us, so we support them. 
Manscaped. Well, let's, let's just blow through these cards and then we'll do a breakdown next week. Um, UFC Fight Night going down tomorrow. We've got Anthony Smith, light heavyweight, taking on Glover Teixeira. Um, great fight. This is a good matchup. Um, Anthony Smith, to me, in my eyes, is... I know Dom Reyes had a great fight with John Jones, but Anthony Smith, to me, is a guy that can give John Jones the best fight at light heavyweight if he's, if he's there mentally. I think the first fight, he just... I don't know. I think he the moment got him. It you know got to him. But I went back and watched a couple of Anthony Smith fights, um, the Gustafson fight, uh, a couple fights before that. Man, that guy's vicious. That guy's going in there to kill you, and he's a fucking animal. His combos are unbelievable. Is I mean, he's he's very very technical, and he does the basics really well. But he's vicious. He's got power, and he throws bombs, and he's very very dangerous. And he's another guy that once you're hurt, he's finishing you he's putting you out um so for me anthony smith he's he's someone to keep an eye on and i think he's going to be gunning for john jones until john jones moves up or both of them retire so he's very very scary and then i'll let you talk about glover a little bit yeah i actually really like glover in this fight i i think he's looked really good recently he quietly went three and oh in 2019 yeah he's kind of gotten back on the horse He's At really 40? only lost How like old is he? 40? Guy. 40, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. He's really good on the ground. And that's kind of where I see Smith usually uses his striking to set up his ground game. I just think Glover's jujitsu is going to be too much. You got Glover? I got Glover. <sighs> wow. I, I think um, Anthony Smith's going to knock him out. Second round knockout. I think it's going to be a good fight. Both of these guys go back and forth. Um, like you said, Glover's only lost to like the best in the division. I I, I made a list. Where the hell is it? Um, he's lost to Gustafson, John Jones, Corey Anderson, and Rumble. Like in the last five years, and those are pretty much his only losses. Besides that, he's blown through you know pretty much everyone. So. Um, I'm going to be looking for Anthony Smith. He's had a long, long layoff. I think he's, what, it's been a year since the Gustafson fight? Something like that? Yeah. Um, I think he's going to be coming for a big finish. Uh, both of the guys, you know, Anthony Smith's got 18 knockouts or TKOs. Glover's got 17 knockouts or TKOs. Uh, Anthony Smith's got 12 submissions. Glover's got eight. So uh, they're pretty close in their finishing ability. It's two guys that are going to finish the fight. Um I think you're definitely seeing a finish here. I'm going Anthony Smith, second round knockout. Yeah, I'm going to take Glover, uh, third round submission. But again, oh. I think it's an even fight. I think it's going to be a good fight. I'm excited to watch it. Can we go ahead and say we were like 70% on the picks last week too? We fucked up the main yeah, event and the co main event. Pretty good. For MMA, that's like winning the lottery. Um, okay, this one's... This one's interesting. OSP, Ovin St. Peru, moving up to heavyweight. Um, I went back and watched some of his fights today. That that could be very interesting at heavyweight. That's a guy that's super athletic, can kind of do it all. Um, explosive, fast. You know, we saw how DC was able to translate to heavyweight. There's a huge speed advantage from coming up from light heavyweight to heavyweight. Um, it'll be interesting to see how he matches up against Ben Rothwell, who's a veteran. You know, he's he's been around forever. He's got a lot of big wins on his resume. Big Country, Brendan Shaw, Brandon Vera, um, Overeem, Matt Mitrione, Josh Barnett, St- Stefan Struve. So he's got a pretty badass resume. Um, so that, that's a great fight in the co-main event. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I I think OSP, I'm a little worried he's got a suspect chin at this point. You know, he's taken a lot of damage. He's now been around a while. He's been knocked out. Um, And so that's where I wonder with these guys who, you know, you worry about them being a risk for getting knocked out. When they move up and wait, when you look at like your Rockholds and your Weidmans and, you know, even, you know, there are other examples too, but um, I, I just worry that, the power is going to be too much. So, and Rothwell moves pretty well for a heavyweight. So he's pretty athletic for a big, yeah, he's pretty athletic for a big grizzly guy. Um, 
Man, but he's got he's got to be like 40 years old too, isn't he? Yeah, but he took the years off of the sport because he had the USADA suspension and stuff. So I don't know. I, I like Rothwell in this particular matchup. I just don't think heavyweight is the answer for OSP. All right, what's your prediction? I got Rothwell uh, second round KO. I think this could be turn into a little bit of a sloppy fight. I think this might end up being a decision. Um, I think OSP pulls it off in a decision. Maybe he's just too fast. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think this is not a great matchup. It's kind of a weird matchup. So I'm going to go OSP um, in decision. And then I'm going to let you talk about the next one. Former champion. And yeah, then um, Felipe Linz against Andre Arlovsky. Linz is the uh, former PFL heavyweight oh. champ debuting in the UFC. I think this is going to be a coming out party for him. I think Arlovsky's shot. I think he's been hit by everyone the toughest, for hardest three generations. In the division. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I just think, I think Linz is, is going to kind of breathe a little bit of new life into that, you know, 10 to 15 range and we'll see what he can do. I mean, he was a champion in the PFL. So I'm kind of interested to see, you know, you kind of see the same faces around heavyweight a lot, and so yeah. I'm interested to see someone new in the mix. All right, so we're going Lens KO. I I agree with you. I think Arlovski's shot. He's taken a lot of damage. He's been fighting for 20 years professionally since Pride, and he's fought everywhere. But um, yeah, I'll go with Lens knockout, maybe second round. Um, other interesting fights on the card, we've got Alexander Hernandez making his return against Drew Dober. That is the all-body fight at 155. Those guys are fucking jacked. Um, Drew Dober's a tough guy. Alexander Hernandez, obviously a guy that was made a lot of noise early and then got knocked out by Cowboy. I think that's a great matchup. What are your thoughts on that fight? I like that fight. I actually like yeah. Drew Dober. I think Drew Dober hits really hard, and I think he's going to be able to kind of chase Hernandez down and, and take him out. But I, I think that's going to be a fun fight. He fights out of Gaethje's camp, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a good fight. Alexander Hernandez is a, it's kind of like a poor man's Texas version of Conor McGregor. Talks a lot of shit. Um, you know, good on the mic talented guy i think i'm gonna go with drew dober too um yeah drew dober's tough um i'll go second round ko drew dober um marvin vittori this is the guy to watch out for he's from italy i believe but um in my in my opinion he gave israel adesanya the hardest fight on his way to the title except calvin gastelum obviously but um he was like maybe the second or third fight for israel and Israel really struggled in that fight. Marvin took him down quite a bit, um, controlled the fight for you know one or two rounds, and then Israel kind of started to pick him apart. But um, he's a tough guy, a young guy, too. I think he's like 22 or 23 years old. He's not that old. Um, yeah. So that, that's a guy to watch out for. Um, Ray Borg versus Ricky Simone. Ricky Simone has a very respectable mullet. Um, Ray he Borg. He it. No. Come on. Yes, it's gone. That <sighs> thing was glorious. What are you doing? What are you doing? Is that like, did you shave the mustache? Is it like the mustache? Yeah. Oh, gone. They're both gone. Rest in peace. Um, versus Ray Borg. Ray Borg's a tough guy. Um, thoughts on that fight? I, I like Ricky Simone. Ricky Simone is the guy who I've had my eye on um, for a while. He's one of Chael Sonnen's guys. So, um, I think that's interesting. I, I just, I don't know what to make of Ray Borg, honestly. Like, it seems like it's like all downhill from that guy since he got arm barred by Mighty Mouse. If you haven't seen that, go to YouTube and type in Ray Borg versus Mighty Mouse arm bar. Unbelievable. Um, okay. Yeah. Prediction in that fight? I'm going to take Ricky Simone by decision. Yeah, I think that's one that goes to decision, too. I'll agree with you on that one. Um, the return of Michael Johnson. So he's making his return. He's been out for a long time, right? When when was the last time he fought? Yeah. Nate Diaz? Over, I think over a year. Was it Nate Diaz? Was his last fight? No. No. Justin Gaethje. Was it Justin Gaethje? No, he fought, he fought at 145 a couple of times. Didn't he fight like Josh Emmett? I don't know. I don't know. It's been a while, but... 
Michael Johnson, explosive guy, talented. Who's he fighting? Do you know? Some uh, newcomer? I didn't recognize the guy's name. All right. Newcomer, um, knockout, Michael Johnson? I don't know. Sure, why not? Yeah, we're getting deep in the card. All right. Boom Kelleher, I like him. The crystal guy, I like listening to him on the podcast. Uh, I think he's on MMA Junkie. Entertaining guy. I'll pull for him. Um, all right. The Vanilla Gorilla making his return to the UFC. Chase Sherman. That's my surprise for you, Parker. Oh, I love it. I love Chase Sherman. Um, bare knuckle boxing. Fought for the heavyweight championship. Lost to, what's the guy's name? The Cuban guy. Tony that Beltran. Is in every single bare knuckle fight I've ever seen. Um, Vanilla Gorilla making his return back. I think he he went out with three losses in a row in the UFC, but he's a tough guy. Every fight I've ever seen him fight is a very, very fun fight. Um, I'm going to go for the Vanilla Gorilla because I like his nickname and I got a selfie with him in Dallas. Um, all right, Billy. Billy wants to do his gambling picks here. All right, I got four picks. I got Felipe Lins. Uh, you get him at minus 155. I got Ben Rothwell, plus 115. Uh, I got Michael Johnson, minus 115. And then I got Hunter Azure, who's fighting Brian Boom Kelleher, at minus 205. He's an 8-0 and prospect, really high on him. think he's going to be uh, a contender at 135. So I like him to beat Boom Kelleher. All right, that's a little bit of a hardcore card right there, huh? The main event's fucking oh, yeah. awesome. The main main event's a banger. Uh, ben Rothwell's exciting fights. OSP, it'll be interesting seeing him at heavyweight. Outside of that, a little bit of a hardcore fight card there. Um, Saturday night, we have another fight night. We've got Overeem taking on Walt Harris. Um, Overeem, obviously a legend of the sport, taking on Walt Harris, who's been out for over a year after the death of his daughter. Um, so interesting fight here. This is kind of to break into the top five ish you know I, w- I would expect these guys are maybe five and six in the heavyweight division right now so Overeem's coming off a loss to Jarzinho Rosenstruck and really I thought he was winning the whole fight um Harris like we said has been off for a while um for me I've got Overeem honestly I, I think Overeem is just he's more experienced he's a better technical fighter um he's seen it all and i still think he's probably got two to three good years left where he can fight at a very very high level so i'm gonna go with i don't i don't really see a knockout here i'm gonna go over him by decision i i I agree with you uh i I think i think over him especially in the clinch is just so good um so i'm gonna take i'll take him i'm gonna say second round knockout because he's our heavyweight so um, yeah, I just don't, I, I don't he's kind of changed his style up, though. He's not as aggressive as he used to be. He's more, I don't know, he fights a lot safer these days, a lot safer, a lot smarter. And that's why, that's the only reason I say, you know, I think he'll go the distance. He went the distance with Jarzinho Rosenstruck, who's, you know, knocked everyone out. So uh, I'll take over him by decision. Um, Claudia Gadea, one of the biggest dime pieces in the UFC, I think. Versus Angela Hill, who is... I love Angela Hill. She's got one of the best Twitters in MMA. Um, great fight. I, I think that's a scrappy fight. I love Angela Hill. She's like the Cowboy Cerrone of women's MMA. She'll fight five to six times a year. And, you know, I, I really like her. So what do you think about that fight? I, I just think there's a uh, blueprint how to beat Claudia now. And it's it's kind of this volume striking, staying on the yeah. outside not letting her wrestle, not letting her get into her game. And Hill's really good at that. And she seems to be getting better with every fight. So I'm going to take Hill by decision. Yeah, I, I do too. I don't see anyone being finished. Um, but I, I agree. I think Angela Hill will stay on the outside, use her Muay Thai, and just outstrike her. So I'm going to go Angela Hill to, by decision as well. Um, okay, Edson Barbosa moving down to 145, taking on Dan Ige, is that how you say his last name? Um, interesting to see him down at 145. Obviously, he's had a, a rough go the last couple of years at 155. Um, he's a guy that I think could have a lot of fun fights down there. Um, yeah, I mean, like you say, it's classical striker versus grappler. Edson's debut at featherweight. Um, 
I don't know. I think if he could come in there, make a lot of noise, he could get some really big fights at featherweight. I think the skills are still there for Edson. I still think he's a pretty elite technician, and I think he's going to be massive at 145 if he doesn't have problems making that weight. So I think he can do damage in this division. I mean, he's really only lost to, like, the absolute top lightweight guys, right? His losses are Gaethje, Khabib, Kevin Lee, yeah. and, uh, oh, my Tony God. Fer- my Tony Ferguson. Tony, Tony Ferguson, Ferguson yeah. right. Yeah. And he beat Dan Hooker. So, like, I don't think he's fallen off. He brutalized Dan Hooker. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's interesting. That's moving up and down. I think that's a that's a good move down. That's an interesting guy to throw in the mix at 145. 145's, you know, pretty stacked right now. So, you know, one or two good wins. I could see him. Edson Barbosa versus Max Holloway is a fucking awesome fight. Yeah. Um, Max Holloway versus yep. anyone's a great fight. <laughs> yeah. A couple more interesting fights just running down the card. Eric Anders against Christoph Jotko. Kind of a, you know, top 15 guys um, at middleweight going at it. Song Yudong against Marlon Vera, I think, is sneakily the best co- fight on this card. Two, like, two guys who I think the winner of this is, like, immediately thrust into the elite at bantamweight. Yeah. Which it's it's murderer's row at bantamweight right now. One through five is crazy. So yeah, um, um, yeah. Return of Matt Brown, Matt the Immortal Brown coming back the to immortal. fight. I always love watching him fight. One of my favorite um, fighters of all time. He's the best. Um, he's been out. Return of Darren Elkins. How long has Matt Brown been out? Two years. Three years. He, he's coming he off was, a torn ACL, right? Yeah, he was supposed to fight on the Columbus card. Yeah. Yeah, Matt Brown. Um, he's Darren Elkins, who the damage to watch fight. Yeah. And Kevin Holland, who's an absolute wild man in the cage. He's like, his first martial art was Kung Fu and just does all kinds of weird stuff. Have you seen the guy that he's fighting from the Contender Series? Anthony, it's not, he's got a very similar name to Anthony Hernandez, but it's not Anthony Hernandez. <laughs> It's uh. I forget Fox. what the guy's name is. His but nickname. His nickname's Fluffy. And he's got, you know, like chest tattoos and stuff. But he murdered someone on the Contender Series. So that I I think that'll be a fun fight. Kevin Holland's off the Contender Series too, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Billy's hardcore gambling picks. I got Alistair over him. You get him as an underdog, actually, plus one forty. So, Parker, write that one down in your little black book. Uh, I got uh, Marlon Vera, plus 160. I think he takes care of business. I think it's too much too soon for Song Yudong. 22 years old. Vera is a is a veteran. I think he takes this one. Uh, I like Edson Barbosa. I really like him, minus 135. And then Kevin Holland, minus 115. I, li- I like that one, too. So... Those are my four picks. Uh, <laughs> listen, listen to Billy on gambling. Don't listen to me. I'm a fucking terrible gambler. Um, all right. That was an hour and a half episode. I think we could have talked about UFC 249 for three hours. I know. I, we got to cut it <laughs> off at some point, Parker. People only have so much time to listen to this. Yeah, but anyways, um, thanks everyone for tuning in again. This is episode 36, and we are rolling them out. So we'll be back. Um, we'll probably throw in an interview shortly within the next week or so. And then we'll do a review of these cards, um, the main events and all the big fights. And then who the hell knows what's going to happen next week. There could be badass fights released next week. Who knows? Who knows? It's a crazy time, strange times, but we are here to keep you up to date. So Parker's MMA show tuning out everyone per normal. Like, subscribe, share, do all the good stuff. Manscapes, Diamonds MMA, Keen Landscape, Discount Dumpsters. Thank you for your sponsorship. Thank you for letting me and Billy do what we like to do is talk about MMA. Billy, any closing words? Just glad to have fights back, my friend. The world is getting more normal every week. So cheers to the UFC, Dana White. Appreciate it. All right. Signing out. Parker's MMA show. Till next time, Billy. 
Grow the mustache back. Adios. All right. Later. Thanks for listening to Parker's MMA Show. Take a moment to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And visit Parker Keen's MMA show.podbean.com for additional information on Parker and to stay up to date on the latest drama in the fight world. For more information and important links about today's episode, check out the show notes.